NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hello everyone, my name is Gay Yi Hill and welcome to JPL's Von Karman Lecture. This is um, an event to the public to learn more about our missions and also to get up close and personal with our scientists and engineers. Those are the folks that do all the hard work and you get to speak to them personally. So before we really get started, a couple of things to let you know. Please turn off your cell phones and silence them. Two, please wait until the end of the presentation before raising your hand for questions. And if you do have a question, please go over to the microphone and address it there so that we can hear your question. And we are also recording this, so we want those questions on the tape, on the recording as well. So let's get started. Tonight's spotlight is on NASA's Dawn mission, and this is the first spacecraft to orbit two extraterrestrial targets, the protoplanet Vesta and the dwarf planet Ceres. Now, this has been an incredibly successful mission. Last month, Dawn was awarded the Collier Trophy, and that is the most prestigious award in aviation and space. I'm sure you're very anxious to hear more about this mission, and who better to talk about it than Don's chief engineer and mission director, Mark Raymond. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Welcome, I appreciate your coming, and um, to everybody who's watching this at home, whether live or recorded, um, sorry you're not getting all the free money that's being given out to all the people here, but, but, but thank you for your interest as well. So uh, I'm going to tell you about the Dawn mission, and uh, as you know, this is run by JPL for NASA. Uh, Caltech operates it, and here we are at JPL. But there are many organizations around the country and indeed around the world involved in this project. But before I start, before I start telling you about the Dawn mission, I want to give you a little bit of context. So let's take a look at what's, what astronomers knew about the solar system in 1800. So here we are with a sort of conventional view of the solar system, looking down on it with the sun in the center. Here are the orbits of the inner planets, including the orbit of Earth, Mars, <laughs> Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And apart from an occasional comet and some moons, this is pretty much what astronomers knew about the solar system in 1800. And in fact, even this was a very modern picture because Uranus had only been discovered in 1781. So the same picture could not have been drawn 20 years earlier. The planets, of course, from Mercury to Saturn were known even to ancient astronomers. So this was a modern view of the solar system in 1800. Now, for fun, although this is the arrangement of the solar system or the contents of the solar system as they were known then, showing you the locations of the planets today on, uh, on this very day. And so that's why if you imagine being here on Earth and Earth rotating this way, then you can see just after the sun has gone down, Mercury and Venus are near the sun. And in fact, uh, maybe you can just barely be catching a glimpse, glimpse of them now, but in the next few weeks, that'll be even easier. But you can also see Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn all are in the evening sky. And uh, when you leave this evening, in fact, Mars and Saturn will be very nicely positioned with the moon between them. Um, so the Mars will be just a little bit below and to the right of the moon, and Saturn below and to the left, and below Saturn will be Antares. So I hope you go out and take a look at it. And for those of you who are watching the recorded version of this, the arrangement of the planets won't change that quickly, and so you can continue to see it in coming days. Um, in fact, even tomorrow the moon will still be nicely positioned. So anyway, again, this is what astronomers knew in 1800. Then along came this fellow, Giuseppe Piazzi, a mathematician and astronomer, and he got the new year off to a good start. He discovered a new planet. I mean, modern astronomers had only ever discovered one planet, so this was quite a significant finding. And I'm going to show you a high-resolution photograph of what Mr. Piazzi discovered, and that's here. She's Ceres, 
the Roman goddess of agriculture and grain. And Ceres, <clears throat> excuse me, is often depicted with her harvest bounty here and her crown of grains. And uh, in this case, the artist has chosen to depict her with a scythe. Different artists use different farm implements to communicate the message, but, but there, it's the same idea. And in fact, if you had cereal this morning, if you had cereal, then you have at least a, uh, an etymological connection with the good goddess. <laughs> so this is Ceres. And now here's the same chart I showed you just a moment ago, the planets as they were known in 1800. And here are the planets as they were known in 1801. And so Ceres fit very nicely into this gap between Mars and Jupiter and for two generations was considered to be a planet. Well, so that makes a nice story, and, and it actually happens to be true. Then along came this fellow, Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers, who was trained as a physician, but was a fantastically productive astronomer. And Olbers made many, many important contributions to astronomy, which are of value even today. But the very next year, 1802, he discovered still another another new body in that part of the solar system between Mars and Jupiter. But more importantly for the story I want to describe to you this evening, in 1807 he discovered still another new object between Mars and Jupiter, what by then was the fourth new member of the solar system family. And I'll show you a high resolution photograph of what the good Dr. Olbers discovered. She's here, Vesta, the goddess of hearth, home, and family. It's interesting. Vesta is, is not as well understood as many of the other figures in uh, classical mythology. And the reason for that is she was worshipped privately in the home. And so there are fewer surviving records of exactly how she figured into Roman mythology than there are of many of the other gods and goddesses. You, you perhaps have heard of the Vestal Virgins, but I'm referring specifically to the goddess Vesta herself. And she's rarely depicted in art. But when she is, she often has this very stern look on her face. But one of the things I hope to convince you of this evening is that the solar system body Vesta is a much happier place. So that's what Dr. Olbers discovered. And now here's the same picture I showed you earlier, but I've zoomed in so Jupiter is the outermost planet. And you can see Vesta also, like Ceres, fit nicely into this gap between Mars and Jupiter. And it also, for around two generations, was considered to be a planet. In fact, um, if you had come to the JPL von Karman lecture 200 years ago, and I don't know how many of you did, you can <laughs> identify yourselves later, there would, have been, there would have been two interesting differences about you. One is your home internet connection would have been slower, and that would be especially problematic for the people who are watching this on their laptops. But the other is, you would have learned in school that Vesta and Ceres were planets, because that's how they were known then. But science and technology advance, and by the middle of the 19th century, more and more and more bodies started to be discovered in this part of the solar system. Until now, it looks more like this. And I will invite the people who are here in the front row to confirm later on, for those of you who are sitting in the back, that I've added 10,320 individual <laughs> dots to this chart to show you the location of that number of asteroids today. Now, we know about many, many, many more asteroids than that. I'm only showing you the ones that are larger than about five miles or so across. Because if I showed you all of them, this would be nothing but an uninterpretable yellowish-green mass. But the point of this is to show you that this part of the solar system, which we call the asteroid belt, or the main asteroid belt, is very different from the inner solar system, which is largely devoid of these bodies. And in fact, if we zoom out, you can see even more clearly. There's something different about this part of the solar system, both from the inner solar system and the outer solar system. And so that raises the question, why is that? Why is this part of the solar system different? Well, you're a good audience for asking that question. I appreciate it, because the next part of my presentation is going to be to try to answer it. But to answer it, I have to take you back in time a little bit before Piazzi's 1801 discovery of Ceres. In fact, I have to take you back to the dawn of the solar system. Get it? I'm telling you about the dawn mission. <laughs> so this is a photograph from Hubble Space Telescope of a large interstellar cloud of gas and dust in the constellation Sagittarius. It's 
It's called the Trifid Nebula. And in fact, if you're an amateur astronomer, you may well have seen this uh, Trifid Nebula with your own telescope. You undoubtedly didn't have as good a view as Hubble, but, but this is something you can see. And what's happening is up here, off the top of the picture, out of Hubble's view, is a brilliant star. And the light of the star is so intense that as it shines down on this interstellar cloud of gas and dust, it's sort of blowing this material away. It's almost as if it's evaporating it in interstellar space. However, right here, there's a knot of material so dense that it's blocking the light of the star and preventing it from, from blowing away the material behind it. That's why this material is sticking here, uh, sort of out of like a finger sticking out of the cloud. Essentially, it's in the shadow of this dense material. And deep inside here, the material is growing so dense, it's collapsing under its own weight. And eventually, it will collapse to form a star. And that's how our star, the sun, formed 4.6 billion years ago. And once you form a star, you can begin to form planets. Because now you have a swirling cloud of debris with material flying around. Now, sometimes these particles will hit and break apart. Other times, however, when they hit, they'll stick together. And we can see that happening with these two particles here. And another particle hits and sticks to that. And another particle and another particle and another particle. And gradually, these grow larger and larger and larger. On the slide, they grow larger to form words. But in space, they grow larger to form rocks. And these rocks grow so large that they have enough gravity to pull in still more material, and then they form planets. And that's how the rocky planets of the inner solar system, one of which is right under our feet, formed about almost 4.6 billion years ago. However, when massive Jupiter formed, its gravity was so intense, it interrupted this process and deprived the material nearby of the opportunity to continue growing to become full-size planets. And so Ceres and Vesta are sometimes called protoplanetary remnants, or simply protoplanets, because they were growing to become full-size planets when Jupiter cut their growth off. And Dawn's mission is to fly out to the asteroid belt and study these objects. So let's summarize the scientific motivation for the mission. We want to explore Ceres and Vesta in order to get insights into physical conditions and processes that were acting at the dawn of the solar system. Because we believe these bodies retain retrievable records of what was going on as planets were building. And these things almost made it to full-size planet status. Now, I think when most people think of asteroids, they think of you know, chips of rock, right? The size of like this building or the size of mountains, something like that. But Ceres and Vesta are different from that. So we can put it into context by looking at all of the asteroids that spacecraft had visited prior to the Dawn mission. And two of them are so small that I've had to put boxes around them just to convince you that there's really something there, compared with Vesta. And when we introduce Ceres, you can see that Ceres and Vesta really are of an entirely different scale. They're nothing at all like these little chips of rock that are asteroids. And so we can look at it differently, <clears throat> excuse me, where here again, Vesta with an equatorial diameter of 350 miles and Ceres, nearly, nearly 600 miles in diameter, compared with two of the large bodies that had been visited, Lutetia, the largest asteroid that any spacecraft had visited. A European Space Agency spacecraft flew by Lutetia uh, six years ago. And Matilda, the largest asteroid a United States spacecraft had visited. And in the interest of full disclosure, I should tell you, I've exaggerated the size of Matilda here because I needed to make it big enough for you to be able to see it. So that shows us that Vesta and Ceres are not at all like asteroids. Rather, they're, more, they're closer to the scale of other solar system objects that you're familiar with. <laughs> and I'm sure you remember in 2006 when the International Astronom Astronomical Union created a new category of solar system bodies, dwarf planets. And oh my goodness, everybody thought, how could Earth be such an interplanetary bully? 
And why were we so inconsiderate? And why didn't we think about Pluto's feelings in the matter? And how could we be so insensitive? Well, whatever you think of that decision, whatever you think of it, when that category was created, Pluto was the second object to have been discovered that fit in that category. Ceres was discovered 129 years earlier, so it was the first object to be discovered that was a dwarf planet. So what this shows me is, once again, Vesta and Ceres aren't just chips of rock. These are big places. They're worlds. And one of the things that I think is so cool about this NASA mission is we're truly exploring uncharted worlds in the solar system. What could be cooler than that? These are the two largest, or prior to the Dawn mission, were the two largest unexplored worlds in the inner solar system. I, I just think that's really neat. But when you look at a picture like this and compare Vesta and Ceres with California, this is deceptive, right? because California is flat, but these are round, three-dimensional bodies. And so they have much more surface area than is suggested in a picture like this. I mean, even Vesta has more than twice the area of California. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we can go into the third dimension and compare the surface area of Ceres with that of the continental United States. And sure, Ceres isn't as big as the United States. Ceres isn't as big as Earth. But it's still a big place. It's 37% of the area of the Excuse me, I misspoke, the contiguous United States. 37% of the area of the contiguous United States. And when you just think about how vast and varied and beautiful the geography and topography and geology of our country are, it suggests there's an opportunity for a lot of diversity, a lot of different things to see on a place like this. I should also point out, just in the interest of being clear, Obviously, this is not the correct color of the United States, right? This is what scientists call false color because it encodes some other scientific information. The same thing for Ceres here. This isn't the way it would appear to your eye, but this is based on uh, Dawn's sensors showing the full surface of Ceres, and so this rectangle is drawn to the same scale as this. So that's an indication of the size of Ceres, but now let's take a look at this mysterious alien world that Dawn is unveiled. And from my perspective, it looks like a little bit of the, is getting a little saturated. But I hope you can see there's a great deal of variety on the surface. And one thing that really stands out is many of these bright features like this one here. And this is one of our photographs of this mysterious crater, a Kator crater, with these bright features just glowing out. I mean, to me, this really just looks like these these mesmerizing lights shining out into the cosmos, just guiding the way for a spaceship from Earth, just <laughs> inviting it to go in for a closer look, and that's exactly what we've done. I should also say, a lot of people, when they first saw this picture, asked us if these could be the lights of an alien city. And I should tell you the truth, I think people should be embarrassed to ask a question like that. <laughs> really, I mean, you know, this is, this is serious work. And that kind of thing, I think, betrays a naivete. Because as we're sending a spacecraft to a place like Ceres, how could we possibly know the Syrians live in cities? Right? <laughs> we couldn't know that. They could live in rural communities. They could live in large states. They may live underground, in which case they wouldn't even have lights. So really, those kind of questions, I think, don't respect the, the way that we advance our knowledge. So again, I don't know how well you can see it in this depiction here, but in addition to the complex shape of the distribution of this material, I hope you can see there are many fractures in the surface here, which I will come back to in a moment. But uh, this picture we just got not very long ago from Dawn's lowest altitude orbit. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what we now understand to be going on here. But while I am, let's, I'll just have running here for you it and other sites on Ceres. And in each case, I'll add the diameter of what you're looking at and Ceres being named for the Roman goddess of agriculture and grain. All of the features on Ceres, including Akator, are named for, um, for deities of agriculture from around the world or festivals associated with agriculture. And you'll see that uh, in, the, in the captions that I'm adding. So what we think has happened here in Akator crater it's 57 miles in diameter. About 80 million years ago, an asteroid slammed into the surface of Ceres and excavated this crater. 
Underground, there was salt water. Think of this. On this alien world, salt water underground, perhaps frozen, perhaps liquid. But it made its way then to the surface in the cold vacuum of space. On the surface, it would freeze and then sublimate, that is transformed from being a solid to a gas. So that means the water molecules would, would, would escape, depart, but they would leave behind the salts that were dissolved in that salt water. And so the bright features there in Akator and elsewhere on Ceres, including on this strange mountain that we're gonna look at here, these bright features are salt that's left over from the sublimation of the subsurface salt water. But one of the things that's intriguing about it is that salt shouldn't remain bright for 80 million years. And so there still remains a question of how it can stay bright even so recently, even, even to now. So there may be, there, that's suggestions of current active geological processes occurring on Ceres. So this crater, Urvera, 106 miles across, but there are craters substantially larger than that on Ceres. And one of the things you can see that's interesting in this crater, well, one of the things you could have seen quickly is the variety of terrain inside the crater. This one, Haolani, is a relatively young crater. It's got very fresh, sharply defined features here, which suggests that it hasn't been exposed to the rain of interplanetary debris to erode it over time. Yelode, again, still not the largest crater, but look at these strange fractures in the surface, some going like this, some going at right angles to it. So we don't fully understand those yet, but it's, it's another indication of a lot of active geology on this body. And this crater, Dantu, sometimes you'll hear it mispronounced as Dantu, has many fractures running around the interior here, which have yet to be fully explained. And Dawn is continuing to orbit Ceres, continuing to take pictures and make a wide variety of other measurements in order to reveal the nature of this mysterious alien world. And in fact, right now, Ceres is orbiting closer to the, or sorry, Dawn, I should say, I misspoke. Dawn is orbiting closer to the surface of Ceres than the International Space Station is to Earth. So as long as there aren't any tall trees there, we'll be okay. <laughs> but I think this is an illustration of the power that we have to be able to send a spacecraft to a distant dwarf planet, go into orbit around it, and get down into a tight orbit to study the nature of this alien world. So that's a quick overview of Ceres. Let's take a look at Dawn's other destination, Vesta. This is the best picture we had of Vesta prior to the Dawn mission. This was taken by Hubble Space Telescope. And if we look at the shape, follow it starting here, going around like this, and it looks pretty much planet-like until you get down to here and you would expect a smoother shape here near the South Pole, smoother curvature, but obviously that's not what we see. And so when astronomers got these pictures at the end of the 1990s, they concluded that what we're seeing is a big crater here, big impact crater with a mountain in the center. And you've seen pictures elsewhere of large craters with a mountain in the center. Maybe you saw them in the pictures I just showed you of the large craters on Ceres, or you've perhaps seen them in pictures from Mars, the Moon, and other large solar system bodies that, air, mostly airless bodies that have craters. And the reason for that is the way you make a crater is you take a big piece of interplanetary debris, it comes screaming down into the surface, and it hits it with so much energy that the surface essentially melts, and it flows away from the impact and then it sloshes back. And as it sloshes back, it solidifies. And so the mountain in the center is to me like a snapshot of the process by which these craters are formed. And so I want to show you an artist's concept of how this crater may have formed on Vesta from the impact of a big piece of interplanetary debris. So here's interplanetary debris, here's Vesta before the impact, and now here's Vesta after the impact. And it sprayed a huge amount of material, a tremendous number of rocks out into space. And some of those rocks went on their own independent orbits around the sun. And some of them may even have made their way to the part of the solar system where you spend most of your time. And if they did and got pulled into the atmosphere by our planet's gravity, they could burn up 
And as you know, when you're out on a nice dark night and you're lucky enough to see a meteor, that's something from outer space burning up in our atmosphere. And if you've seen that, you may actually have seen a piece of Vesta from that impact burning up in the atmosphere. Now, when I say that, I'm not just being poetical or clever, but I am poetical and clever. <laughs> I'm being serious because we now know from the Dawn mission that 6%, think of this, one in every 16 meteorites seen to fall from Earth came from that one impact at Vesta a billion years ago. And now, maybe you know we have meteorites from Mars. I'm sure most people have heard of that. Maybe you also know we have meteorites from the moon. But we have far, far, far more meteorites from Vesta than we do from the moon or Mars. And those are the only three solar system bodies to which we have linked specific meteorites. In fact, we actually have more material on Earth, in, identified on Earth from Vesta than we do from the moon, even accounting for the more than 800 pounds of material that Apollo astronauts brought back from the moon. We have significantly more from Vesta than we do. And this is a picture of a meteorite from Vesta. I took this picture myself in a museum. These are very common. You can find these everywhere. In fact, one of them landed in this box. Um, and, and so these are, these are very, very common here on Earth. And I think that's really remarkable that we have so many samples of this alien world and we were able to confirm that with Dawn's mission there. So that's the meteorite story, but let's get back to Vesta itself. Here again is our view of Vesta prior to the Dawn mission. And this is what Dawn revealed. And of course, we then got in much closer and revealed this alien world in all of its richly detailed, intimate character. And one of the first things we saw was this triplet of craters, which you won't be too surprised we nicknamed the snowman. And this is part of that big crater at the South Pole. And I'll show you another view of that in a, little, in a little bit. This is the big mountain there. And to our great surprise, there's this network of about 90 canyons near the equator, that rival the, some of which rival the Grand Canyon in size. And these are now understood to be a result of the big impact here that almost completely, de almost destroyed Vesta. It hit with so much energy that that energy reverberated inside Vesta and broke up the ground hundreds of miles away. I think that's really remarkable. Now, we, we took 31,000 pictures of Vesta. I actually requested permission to show all of them to you tonight, but they wouldn't allocate me enough time. But we can put them together into an animation to show you what it would look like if you were there. And one of the first things you'll notice is that the northern hemisphere is much more densely cratered than the southern hemisphere. And by the way, here are some of those canyons, and you'll see them elsewhere here. Here's part of the network as well. So why is the southern hemisphere so, much, so lightly cratered compared to the northern hemisphere? It's because that big impact at the South Pole sprayed out so much material that it resurfaced the southern hemisphere, and the record of cratering had to start all over again. And so there are many fewer craters there. Here's part of the wall of the South Polar Crater. Part of it's been destroyed over the subsequent hundreds of millions of years by the continuous rain of other interplanetary debris that's come down on it. And here we are looking, so here again is the wall of that crater. This crater is 300 miles, actually more than 300 miles in diameter. Think of that, this is really remarkable. And the, the mountain in the center, 110 miles across at the base, and it soars to more than two and a half times the height of Mount Everest. Your planet doesn't have anything like this topography. And so I think that's, that's really remarkable. And this is, I include this to be perfectly honest because it's just one of my favorite views of Vesta. Here again is this triplet of craters, the snowman. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a great deal of detail, a lot of structure in here showing that there's complex geology on this, this world. And here you can see the more densely cratered northern hemisphere, the more lightly cratered southern hemisphere, and part of the network of chasms running in between them. So this one view, I think, captures a lot of what's, what's so cool about Vesta. 
So that's a quick overview of Vesta, but let me tell you about the mission overall. So we started from many people's favorite planet, Earth. We launched in September 2007. And we started out with a big rocket. I just threw that in to help keep you awake. And on the way out to, Mar to the asteroid belt, we flew by Mars in order to get a gravity boost or a gravity assist. You probably heard of that. We fly by Mars and rob it of it, some of its orbital energy around the sun in order to help fling the spacecraft even farther. And as a fully responsible, environmentally responsible and otherwise institution, NASA and JPL believe very much in conserving energy. And so in order to speed up the spacecraft, Mars had to slow down. So Mars actually orbits the sun more slowly now because of Dawn's flyby than it did beforehand. And so if you're keeping track, following the February 2009 flyby, Mars moves more slowly by a rate of one inch per 180 million years. <laughs> and in July of 2011, Dawn got to Vesta, went into orbit around it, and we spent 14 months there uh, studying this, this unique body. Then we left orbit and spent two and a half years more traveling through the solar system to get to Ceres, which we reached in March of last year. The spacecraft is in orbit around Ceres now, and it will stay there essentially forever. And at each body, we make a comprehensive set of measurements. We take many, many pictures, right? You're visual creatures, we're visual picture creatures, we all love to see neat pictures, and so we've taken a lot of pictures and I've shown you some of those. We also take pictures in stereo at different angles in order to make a topographical map, which is how I was able to show you the animation I showed you earlier of series was the accurate topography on it, and that's also how I was able to tell you the height of the mountain on Vesta. We also map the elemental composition, that is, what kinds of atoms are there. If you remember your uh, high school chemistry or physics with the periodic table of the elements, which, which items on that periodic table, the ones of geological interest, uh, occur on these bodies. And we also map the mineralogical composition, that is, what kind of rocks are there. But that's also how we know that the, uh, that bright material is salt. That's the mineralogy. We also measure the gravity field because that tells us about the interior structure of these bodies. How are they organized inside? And so, for example, one of the things we learned at Vesta is that it has a dense iron nickel core surrounded by a mantle, surrounded by a crust, similar to the architecture of Earth. The, in the um, core of Vesta isn't, isn't currently molten like part of Earth's core is. But once again, that illustrates these aren't just just asteroidal chunks of rock. In fact, in, in most ways, Vesta is more closely related to the planets, the rocky planets of the inner solar system than it is to typical asteroids. It's more like a mini terrestrial planet. And we also search for moons because these objects are certainly large enough they could have them. And so as we flew in toward Vesta and Ceres, we used our camera to look for moons orbiting them. Interestingly, we didn't find any, and we don't know what the, the scientific uh, implication of that is. However, I can say we do now know that Ceres has a moon. Its name is Dawn. So I think that's kind of neat. So this raises some sort of interesting points. Dawn is the only spacecraft ever to orbit an object in the main asteroid belt. It's also the first spacecraft to reach a dwarf planet and the only one to orbit it. But it's also the only spacecraft ever, in more than 58 years of space exploration, the only spacecraft ever to orbit any two extraterrestrial destinations. Which when you think about it, really is kind of a surprising thing. Right? It seems like a very obvious mission to undertake. Go someplace, spend enough time there, linger in orbit, make detailed comprehensive measurements, then go someplace else and do the same thing. And yet it had never, been, never even been tried prior to the Dawn mission. It's not as if nobody ever thought of it, right? It happens in science fiction all the time. Go to some planet, do whatever you're going to do there, you know, beat somebody up or make out with them, and then go to some other planet and do the same thing. But it had never been tried before. And so that raises the question, why is that? I mean, why had we never tried it? Well, thank you for asking that question as well. 
The reason is because until recently, engineers were confronted with the problem of they were just trying to do something that was beyond their technological capability. Right? It was just too hard with the technology that was available. And so here at JPL a number of years ago, I got together with some colleagues and we asked the question, how can we travel around the sun more easily and less expensively? And our answer to that was ion propulsion. Now, if you're like me, and I know some of you are, the first time you ever even heard of ion propulsion was in science fiction. First time I ever heard of it was in a Star Trek episode. And uh, it was made, there was good use made of it in Star Wars, where here the TIE fighter that was used to fight the members of the Rebel Alliance. In the Star Wars universe, the TIE fighter stands for Twin Ion Engine, because this was one of the most futuristic, coolest, advanced technologies that George Lucas could think of. And to me, one of the things that's so rewarding about working on projects like this is the opportunity to turn that science fiction into science fact. And so here's an artist's concept of Dawn using its ion engine just a little bit more than one year ago, thrusting with its ion engine as it goes into orbit around distant dwarf planet Ceres. And this is a photograph of an ion engine operating in a vacuum chamber. And we have a facility just a few hundred yards from here up the hill. And you can see it really does produce this cool blue glow like in science fiction movies. And the reason for that is because the, the propellant xenon, which is like helium or neon but heavier, it's one of the noble gases or inert gases, just happens to glow blue like neon, its chemical cousin, just happens to glow orange, as you know from neon signs. And the ion propulsion is 10 times the efficiency of conventional chemical propulsion. So this would be like having your car get 300 miles per gallon. And that's really the key to what allows us to undertake a uniquely ambitious mission. Because without it, Dawn would not be just difficult. It would be impossible, truly impossible, to orbit two distant extraterrestrial destinations. Now, it's interesting. The, although the ion engine is very, very efficient, we only flow a very small amount of xenon through the engine at a time. So although it's very efficient, the thrust is also very gentle. And in fact, I'm going to do an ion propulsion experiment here for you. And this is pretty safe. You can do this yourself at home. And that is the ion engine pushes on the spacecraft as hard as this single piece of paper pushes on my hand. And yet, in the zero gravity, frictionless conditions of space flight, gradually the effect of this thrust can build up. So it would take Dawn two weeks at full throttle, two weeks to expend just one gallon of propellant. So that's, that's why the thrust is so gentle. And in fact, if we thrust for, it would take four days to go from zero to 60 miles per hour. Doesn't exactly evoke the concept of a drag racer. <laughs> but instead of thrusting for four days, if you thrust for a week, or a month, or a year, or as Dawn already has for more than five and a half years, you can achieve fantastically high velocity. And so this is what I like to call acceleration with patience. And if you're patient, and I am, I'm a very patient guy, this is a great way to explore the solar system. And this is really the key to what has allowed us to undertake this mission, which once again would be impossible without it, without the ion propulsion. Excuse me. Now, I told you that ion propulsion's been around in science fiction for a long time. I, once again, because of the constraints of time, I, I can't give you the entire history of ion propulsion. <laughs> but I can tell you that it goes back quite a long ways. But let's focus just on Dawn, which you can see here in an artist concept. And the first thing you notice is it's dominated by these huge solar arrays. When we launched Dawn in September 2007, the solar array wingspan was the largest for any interplanetary spacecraft NASA had ever launched. Why? Because we go far from the sun. So we need a large area of solar cells to capture enough of that faint sunlight to produce electrical power to operate all the systems. And in particular, that ion engine is power hungry. 
It takes a lot of electrical energy to ionize and accelerate xenon. So the solar rays, wingtip to wingtip, are 65 feet. That's the distance from a pitcher's mound to home plate in a professional baseball field. And in fact, if the full-size spacecraft were here in the room with the, the, um, this solar array here at the front, basically at the screen, this one would reach almost all the way to the back. It would reach to just about the people who are sitting at the back of the room. And um, for those of you who are watching this on your laptop, that's a long way. So this is really a remarkably large spacecraft. For another sense of scale, this is our main antenna, which is five feet in diameter. And this is how we communicate with the spacecraft, even from across the solar system. This is one of our ion engines here. Here's a second ion engine. And what do you know? There's a third ion engine. So we actually do the Star Wars TIE fighters one better. So that was an artist's concept. Here's a photograph of the spacecraft when it was being built in a clean room here on Earth. And this is one of the solar array wings. Here's another one. And these are folded up because you can't fit a 65-foot wide spacecraft in the nose cone of a rocket. So when the spacecraft gets into space, after the nose cone, or sorry, when the rocket takes the spacecraft into space, after the nose cone uh, releases or separates and the rocket releases it, the solar rays open up, and to me, it's like a big interplanetary dragonfly taking flight. I think, that's, I think that's pretty neat. Here are some of the sensors that we use for studying Vesta and Ceres. This is one of our ion engines. And this one foot diameter metal grid here has 15,000 little holes in it through which we shoot the xenon ions at speeds up to 90,000 miles per hour. 90,000 miles per hour. That's why these, as these xenon ions depart with such high velocity, they give a relatively large push back on the spacecraft, and that's what makes it so efficient. And since I mentioned the xenon a few times, the xenon is stored in a tank inside the main spacecraft structure here, and I thought I'd show you a picture of xenon. So this is actually a picture. Actually, it's my chameleon xenon, my pet chameleon, and because of his, his greenish, bluish color here, he has kind of a cosmetic affection for xenon. And to tell you the truth, he gets a kick out of being included in my public presentations. <laughs> and when I go home tonight and tell him that not only did a bunch of people here in the Pasadena La Cunada area see him, but people watching at home on their laptops are going to see him, he's going to think that's pretty cool. <laughs> but back to the spacecraft. So here's the main spacecraft structure here. Uh, here's that five-foot diameter antenna. Here's Tom. And this is one of the two solar array wings. Each individual wing at 27 feet is the width of a singles tennis court. This is a very large spacecraft. And I don't know about you, but I think spacecraft are neat things to look at. Right? They're neat. And you can, the people here in the room can look at some historic and, and fascinating spacecraft. Right? They're cool. They're neat to look at. But to me, neater than what spacecraft look like is what spacecraft do. And so I'd like to spend a moment talking about what spacecraft do. Because we use them to go far from home. This, of course, is home. And to the accuracy I can do PowerPoint, this is low Earth orbit. It's space, but it's not very far away. It's not very far away. In fact, from here to San Diego is comparable to the distance from the surface of Earth to low Earth orbit, and somewhat farther than that. And this is where many, many spacecraft, including the space shuttle when it was flying, the International Space Station now, and many others work. Space, but not very far away. So let's zoom out and now introduce what's called geosynchronous orbit. And in geosynchronous orbit, as I know some of you know, a satellite takes 24 hours to go around Earth. So if we have a satellite going around Earth in 24 hours, and Earth itself rotating in 24 hours, then the satellite is always over the same point on Earth. Or, from the point of view of Earth, the satellite is always in the same place in the sky. And so that's why this is a very convenient location for weather satellites, communication satellites, or other satellites that you want to have either have a fixed view of the surface of Earth, or from our perspective here on Earth, have a, having a fixed location in the sky, so you don't have to always be repositioning your antenna here on the ground. 
And at uh, almost 22,300 miles away, geosynchronous orbit is a long way away. That's a long distance. That's far even compared to the diameter of our planet. And in the more than 58 years of sending spacecraft or satellites into space, the overwhelming majority have gone to somewhere between low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. Okay. So now with that context, let me move the same setup down here. And now I'm going to introduce the moon and put the moon where it belongs at the same scale. The moon is really far away. The moon is 10 times the distance to geosynchronous orbit. The moon is 30 times the diameter of our planet in distance. The moon is a quarter of a million miles away. That's, that's really far away. And you may have heard legends, stories told by our ancestors that long ago, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, 24 men traveled the distance from the Earth to the moon. But people don't do that today. People don't do that. People go farther than the distance from here to San Diego, but not, not as far as the distance from here to San Francisco. But one time in the distant past, people did. And so what that tells me is this picture is of the scale of the entire range of firsthand personal human experience throughout all of human history. It's all contained in a picture of about this size. And Dawn passed the orbit of the moon the day after it launched. And so we launched on September 27, 2007. And on September 28, we had the moon in our rear view mirror. So now let's introduce the next scale here, which is Earth's orbit around the sun. And as Earth goes around the sun, of course, it carries the moon with it. So let's bring the sun into this picture now. This is the sun. And to the correct scale, this is the orbit of the moon. And this is the size of the Earth, all to the same scale. The sun is large even compared to the orbit of the moon. The sun is large compared to the entire range of firsthand personal human experience throughout all of human history. It could easily be contained inside the sun. The sun is 865,000 miles in diameter. The sun is 109 times the diameter of the Earth. From this, we can conclude the sun is big. <laughs> OK, so with this context now, let me put, get rid of some of that stuff and put the sun down in the lower right corner and bring the orbit of the Earth in here. Magnify it for a moment to show you that little bluish thing. That's the orbit of the moon. Earth itself is much, much too small to show up in this scale. So the sun down here, the orbit of the Earth here, that's the orbit of the moon. Dawn was as far away as the sun in 2010. This year, it's four times as far away as the sun, more than 1,500 times as far from Earth as the moon, well in excess of a million times farther away than the International Space Station. And that, to me, is what's really cool. And corny as it sounds, and that's OK. I know it sounds corny. On NASA JPL missions that I've worked on, including Dawn, when the spacecraft is passed on the far side of the sun, I've gone outside and put my thumb up and blocked out the sun and thought, gosh, we have a spacecraft on the far side of the sun. I mean, this is the same sun that's shown down on our planet for four and a half billion years. This is the same sun that's the source of virtually all of the energy our planet has ever had and will ever have. This is the same sun that so dominated human thought in art, literature, culture, philosophy, science, mythology, and religion throughout all of human history. This is the same sun that's the gravitational master of our solar system. It's a third of a million times the mass of our planet. This is the same sun that's our signpost in the Milky Way galaxy. And yet we can send spacecraft to the other side of the sun. And when I say we, I don't mean the Dawn team. I don't mean everybody here at JPL or everybody at NASA. I don't even mean the entire engineering and science community. I mean everybody. I think everyone participates in missions like this. To me, everyone who's ever looked up at the night sky in wonder, anyone who has any curiosity at all 
about, about Earth and how it fits in. Anybody who feels that longing to know the cosmos or who, who wants to understand the, the nature of nature, I mean, for that matter, anybody who's just ever felt that, that drive for a bold adventure, right? A noble undertaking to go beyond the next horizon and see what's there. I think everybody participates in a mission like this. And that, to me, is what's most exciting about this kind of thing. Because I think of Dawn and the other spacecraft around here truly as humankind's robotic, robotic ambassadors to the cosmos. And I think we all share in that. And that's what I think is really rewarding about this. So that raises the question, how do we do this? Well, we start by putting the spacecraft on top of a huge bomb and hoping <laughs> that it blows up in a controlled fashion, and it usually does. And we got Dawn off to a, quite a beautiful launch. In fact, Dawn launched at dawn. I don't know how well you can see it here, but the sun is rising in the background. So we left Cape Canaveral at dawn in September 2007. And then when we got into space, this is our trajectory. And once again, it's this conventional view with the sun in the center. Here's the orbit of Earth and the orbits of other bodies. And as we follow the trajectory for dawn along, when it's this nice xenon chameleon blue color is where we're thrusting with the ion engine. And where it's dark is where we're coasting. And so we launched in September of 2007 when Earth was here. And you can see we coasted a little bit. And then we thrust. and had some coasting and thrusting while we were checking out the ion engines and other systems, getting the spacecraft ready for its, its interplanetary journey. Then we got into a pretty regular pattern of ion thrusting most of the time. And in fact, just as a subtle technical detail, the durations of these coast periods here, that is where we're not thrusting, are exaggerated in this because the software used to generate this, um, this trajectory samples it just once a day. But so we're really actually thrusting more than it looks like here. But you can see thrusting most of the time. Then we had this long coast period during which we flew by Mars in order to speed up the spacecraft and slow Mars down. Then we continued spiraling gradually farther and farther and farther from the sun until July of 2011 when we got to Vesta, went into orbit around Vesta, accompanied it for 14 months, making our comprehensive set of measurements and ex maneuvering extensively from one orbit to another around Vesta, one of the benefits of the ion propulsion system is not only do we get into orbit, but once we're there, we can fly to different orbits in order to optimize our scientific investigations. Then we use the ion propulsion system to break out of Vesta orbit, undertake this two and a half year climb through the main asteroid belt until we got to Ceres just a little bit more than a year ago, went into orbit around Ceres, and the spacecraft is staying there and will stay there essentially forever. And in fact, where this, uh, the line turns from bold to light represents the end of Dawn's prime mission, which was June 30th. So we successfully completed this 8.8 year, 3.5 billion mile journey just a couple weeks ago. But we're very grateful that NASA has decided to extend the mission because it's going so well and there's still more neat things we can do at Ceres. And so we're continuing our exploration there. And so we can zoom in right now and see where Dawn is today. So you can see we've progressed a little bit beyond the end of the primary mission. And on this scale, you can't see the difference between where Dawn is and where Ceres are. They're basically in the same place on the scale of the solar system. But we can also zoom in and see where Vesta is today. And so one thing that's sort of interesting is we departed Vesta from here, so that was a little bit more than one Vesta year ago. And actually, Dawn is now farther from Vesta than the Earth is from the Sun. Again, to me, this is cool. This is a reminder that this is an interplanetary spaceship. right? We go to distant bodies. We orbit them. Then we can travel from there huge distances to go elsewhere to explore as well. And since I mentioned Earth, we can zoom in and see where Earth is today. And that's actually where it is right now. And in fact, those of you who came here drove in through the guard facility here, went in here, you parked up here, and we're in here right now. And actually, unfortunately, I can see that uh, that gentleman back there, you left your lights on. But um, you might want to go out and take care of that. So that's the overview of the trajectory. But you know, when you look at a picture like this, 
It's flat and it's static. And it's easy to forget that the solar system is in, is in motion. The way I think of it is the solar system has this big, beautiful, complex choreography. And so let's take a look at an animation of what's going on here. So I want to get oriented here first so that as the animation progresses, you can follow it. So once again, the standard view, the sun is in the center. Blue is the orbit of Earth here. Red is the orbit of the red planet Mars. This is the orbit of Vesta. And this is the orbit of Ceres. And starting out by showing you the locations of these things, wh where they were in March of 2007, so that you can sort of synchronize your, your watching of it in preparation for the September 2007 launch. Excuse me. And what you'll see is that Vesta is going to go all the way around the sun before we get to it. And Ceres is going to go around almost two full times before we get to it. it, it it's much more complicated than just going to a out to a certain distance from the sun. You have to get to the right place at the right time. So here in September 2007, the spacecraft leaves Earth, lights up its ion propulsion system. We're now aiming to fly by Mars. Remember that occurred while we were coasting. So here we've flown by Mars, turn on the ion propulsion system again. We're aiming for Vesta, but won't get there until here. And Ceres is going to go all the way around the sun for another full revolution before we get there. But finally, as we get into 2011, Dawn gets to Vesta, goes into orbit around it, once again spends 14 months there making its extensive measurements. In September of 2012, fires up the ion engine heading for Ceres. It looks like it's not that far away, but that's a long, arduous climb through the asteroid belt, two and a half years to get there. Excuse me, but as we get into early 2015, it did indeed go into orbit. And that's where the spacecraft is right now. And once again, that's where it will be effectively forever orbiting the sun with the largest body between Mars and Jupiter. And it's continuing now its exploration of this strange alien world. So that's a broad overview of the mission. I can tell you that we have lots of things going on. We're very busy. There's all kinds of things going on all the time. I'm not going to bore you with every imaginable detail of what's happening. Instead, I will just thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your letting me tell you about the Dawn mission. So thank you very much. Better hurry. I will, so I'm happy to take questions for a little while. I'll remind you if you would like to ask a question, please come up to the microphone. And while people are doing that, I'll just tell you that if you're interested in the Dawn mission, you can go to our website, dawn, D A W N, dot JPL, dot NASA, dot gov. You can see all kinds of cool things about the mission. We release a new picture every day, sometimes more, but at least every workday, we release a new picture of series. We have lots of educational activities there for students and teachers. And of course, we're all students, so um, there are a lot of neat things to learn. Uh, if you enjoy the way I talked about it, I have a sort of a blog there called the Dawn Journal and write about the mission in kind of the same way I talk about it here. Plus, we have more frequent status reports and other things as well. So questions? Yes, thank you very much. The lecture was fascinating. Um, thank you. you spoke a little bit about the formation of Jupiter and how that um, stopped the formation of these protoplanets. And I was wondering if you could say a little more about how that happened. Sure. Excuse me. So first, can somebody verify that the microphone worked so everybody can hear? OK. So I, I won't repeat the question for you. Uh, when Jupiter formed, it did several things. One of them is that its, its gravity um, tugged and pulled on all this other material that was orbiting the sun and sort of stirred it up. And the consequence of that is when things hit, they wouldn't necessarily uh, come together with these gentle approaches like this and stick together. But rather, they would tend to hit at higher velocities and so not stick together but break apart. In addition, it actually ejected a lot of that material from that region, that is, scattered it to elsewhere in the solar system. And so not only were collisions that occurred less effective in building larger bodies, but there were many fewer collisions. There was much less material to work with. And so what was there 
uh, didn't get the opportunity to continue growing. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. This has been a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So it stated that one of the main mission points was to measure the gravitational field. What kind of tolerance is there between the gravitational field as you understand it when the mission starts and when you actually arrive? How do you account for fluctuations in fuel consumption that, that'll OK, entail? so you're saying, uh, how do we account for the fact that we didn't know the gravitational field when we, yeah. before we got there? OK, that's, that's an insightful question, because it's another one of the many unique aspects of the Dawn mission is this is the only mission ever that's gone to a massive solar system body to orbit it which had not previously been visited by a flyby spacecraft. So Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, these other massive bodies that um, spacecraft have orbited, all had been visited by flyby spacecraft. So we had measurements of the gravitational fields before we got there. Dawn did not. And so there were a number of ways that we accounted for it. But thanks to the flexibility of the ion propulsion system, Essentially, what we would do is, here's our massive body. Here's the spacecraft flying in. We would fly toward it and measure the gravitational pull, if you will, as we got in, determine with the extraordinary and exquisite accuracy that interplanetary navigation is able to achieve, measure that gravitational pull, and then update our, our flight plan, our thrust profile, that is, the aiming of the ion engine and the throttle level that we use, update it to account for our improving accuracy in the gravitational field as we got closer and closer. So essentially, you fly in a little, measure the gravity field. Fly in a little closer, measure it more accurately. Fly in still closer and measure it still more accurately. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, sure. Yes, sir. Hello, and Hi. congratulations on this extraordinary accomplishment. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, as I was looking at those amazing photographs of Ceres, that, wow, it's the surface of Ceres is like a record of every piece of whatever from space that's slammed into it. And I was just wondering, is there, um, do you think any of the surface of an object like Ceres is the result of any kind of internal forces, and is there any way to know that? So uh, that's a good question, and I give wordy answers. I'll start with the short answer, yes. There, are, there is good reason to believe, in fact, excellent reason to believe, that, um, that there are internal geological processes operating on Ceres which directly affect the surface. And we can see that in several ways. One of them is I showed you that Akator crater. In a moment, you'll even see it rotating uh, into view in this picture. It'll be the bright thing. I don't know when it's going to come around. But um, as I said, that's, that's to measured to be only about 80 million years old. And, um, and the bright material there has to be even younger than that. And so there, there are current geological processes. But more to the point, you um, started with the reasonable um, comment that it's, it's recorded everything that's hit it um, throughout the, the almost four and a half, or more than four and a half billion years of the solar system. But in fact, there are a number of areas on Ceres, you can't see it very well in this picture, which actually are relatively smooth. That is, don't show many craters. And we have. Um, mathematical methods that I could describe if you're interested for predicting how many craters of certain sizes should occur on, uh, on Ceres. Partly it's based on some of the craters we see on Vesta. And there aren't as many large craters there as it seems there should be. And so that's the suggestion that perhaps there are geological processes that over time erase those craters. And so, um, so one of the things that planetary geologists are working on now is understanding the nature of these, these processes. Um, there, are other, there are other geological evidence as well of, of the effect of Ceres' internal activity uh, much more recently than, the, or occurring much more recently than the four and a half billion years since it formed. Does Thank that you. make sense? You're yes. welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Good evening. Uh, just Hi. two questions on the design of the spacecraft. First of all, you mentioned, I think, that it had another uh, ion engine, which I assume is two. We have three. You have three. Is it's it? the, the Star Wars TIE fighters only have two. We, we have three. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, that strict... Our lasers aren't as powerful as theirs, but, you know, can't have everything. Theirs were gold-plated. It was a military project. That's right. <laughs> Is that strictly for redundancy, or you actually use those to re eliminate the need to turn the craft around? OK, uh, so that's a good question. Before I answer it, let me explain for other people. When he asks about redundancy, the idea is, do we have more than one in case one fails? That's, that's what you mean by that term, yes. right? Um, so it turns out that there's a mechanism that we understand very well by which ion engines wear out in space. Uh, because of use, just like, I mean, lots of, you know, physical devices um, get consumed by their use. And so given the amount of xenon propellant that we had to expend in order to accomplish the Dawn mission, we had to have two ion engines. That is, one uh, would wear out too soon, or we didn't have sufficient confidence that we could do it with mm. one. So we carry two in order to have sufficient lifetime. And then the third is for exactly what you raised, so that was an insightful observation. The third is in case one fails. However, as it turns out, all three are still healthy. So um, we didn't have uh, any problems with the ion engines. Uh, and we, we don't pick them on the basis of what direction we want to thrust, because you can even see in this picture, and I'm going to turn this picture off in a moment only because my computer doesn't like staying on one picture for too long, but, uh, or maybe it'll quit for me and embarrass us all when it says PowerPoint has a problem. But, um, but see, there's one engine here, one here, and one on the back side. So that's not enough to cover all the directions anyway, if you wanted to point an engine up in this way. So, so we don't use it for that purpose. If we want to point an ion engine in that direction, we rotate the entire spacecraft and point the ion engine in that direction and go there. Thank you. And it seems to be, I mean, this is an ambitious size of a solar array to have work and unfold perfectly and everything. Did you have a trade-off between thinking of using an, uh, like a radioisotope power supply? Or what was your thinking on that? OK, so the. And I'll, I'll thank you for the answer. And <laughs> let, let. You might want to wait until after I've answered it, yeah, but okay. that's your, your call. <laughs> but once again, for other people's benefits, this radioisotope uh, thing that he referred to is, in fact, you can see them for the people in the room. I'm even going to, I don't know if you can see the laser pointer here, but this black structure sticking out of the side of Voyager here uh, is what's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. This scale model of the Cassini spacecraft here has them. If you go into the museum, which I think is open this evening, I'm not sure, you can see models of them on the Galileo spacecraft as well. Um, so these are devices which contain radioactive materials, which when they decay, produce heat. And that heat is used to produce electricity. And it's not a, it's not a re nuclear reactor, but it uses nuclear energy. And we, do not, we did not consider using them on Dawn for several reasons. One is they are very, very expensive. And so you only use them if you really have to. They were well worth the investment for the fabulous return of Voyager and uh, Cassini here and Galileo and other missions, many other missions. But also, they actually don't produce enough electrical power. Devices like that only can produce 100 or a few hundred watts. And the ion engine itself, just to turn on the ion engine, takes well over 500 watts just to turn it on. And normally, in fact, we've actually never operated it at that low uh, uh, power level. When we started, we were thrusting with more than two kilowatts. And so the mass of these devices would completely overwhelm the benefit of the ion propulsion system, because we would have to propel that mass through the solar system. So having these large solar arrays, for us, was the better trade. But every mission makes its own trades on what the most effective way is to accomplish whatever its objectives are. So I lost track of where that gentleman is, but I hope that answered his question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. Um, I was wondering how we know the asteroid debris on Earth is, came from Vesta, and 
why the um, north part of it is much more densely cratered than the south. Okay, so the first part, how do we know that these meteorites, and I, I forgot to say, if you want to come up and take a look at this afterwards, you're welcome to. How do we know these meteorites came from Earth? There are a number of lines of evidence, but it started with uh, a method that I need to explain to you called infrared reflectance spectrum. So let's break that down. Infrared, a wavelength of light that we can't see, but we know is there, just as there are wavelengths of sound that we can't hear, but your dog could confirm for you that there are wavelengths of sound that we can't hear, but that are detectable. So there are wavelengths of light we can't see, infrared. Reflectance, that just means the infrared light from the sun bounces off Vesta and you know, goes elsewhere, just like the visible light does. And the spectrum is where you break up the light into its constituent colors. So think of using a prism on white light, and you see, quite literally, all the colors of the rainbow. Right? So you break it up into its constituents. We can do that with infrared light as well. And it turns out when you do that, that the infrared reflection contains sort of the fingerprint or the signature of the material that reflected it. Some infrared wavelengths are ref reflected very strongly, so it's bright at those infrared wavelengths. Some are not reflected very well, so it's dark. And so this, this produces a distinctive pattern for different materials. And so in around 1970, astronomers started using infrared detectors to look at astronomical bodies. They looked at Vesta, measured this in now infrared reflectance spectrum, and found that it was a, a wonderful match for this large class of minerals that occurred in these, um, in these meteorites. For experts, the minerals are called howardites, eucrites, and diogenites. So the, the meteorites, if you want to want to get them, they're actually not very expensive because they're so common. I, I bought this myself before I even ever heard of the Dawn mission because I thought it'd be cool to own a piece of Vesta. So they're called HEDs, H-E-D, um, Howardite, Eucrite, Diogenite. These, these minerals were a, a great match for Vesta. That's what made the initial connection. There are other lines of evidence as well that I could tell you about if you care. I'm giving sort of a long answer. But it wasn't until Dawn got there and made much more detailed measurements that we're able to clinch the story. Now the other question you asked was why is the northern hemisphere more densely cratered than the southern hemisphere? And the reason is because that impact that, that excavated this material just happened to occur deep in the southern hemisphere, near the South Pole. So some of that material was thrown out with so much energy that it left the vicinity of Vesta and went elsewhere, including to here on Earth. But some of it, just like if you had a big impact here on Earth, some of the stuff would fly up and come down someplace else. So it landed elsewhere in the southern hemisphere and erased the craters that had already formed there. It resurfaced it. And so you can think of it as the northern hemisphere records four and a half billion years of stuff falling on it, whereas the southern hemisphere had its record wiped clean, and so it only records one billion years. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you're welcome. I apologize for my wordiness. <laughs> Hi, I have a, a pretty good intuition for um, a, you know a chemical rocket engine. I watched a lot of videos and heard, heard the audio, and I've even seen some live. Heard the um, what? Heard the audio. I've oh. you know heard some live, yeah. um, I, but I, I don't have a good intuition for what an ion engine is like. Nobody does. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious. Darth Vader, right? Because he flies in Tie Fighters. <laughs> Um, but I'm sort of wondering, like, what, what it would sound like. Uh, you know, what would happen if I put my my hand a, a foot away from it? What if I stood ten feet away from it? Like, what, what's it like? Okay, so um, first of all, what it would sound like. For all intents and purposes, the ion engine can only work in a vacuum chamber. So, in space, part. Somebody can't hear me. Okay, so in space, you in space, nobody can hear you. You can't hear an ion engine in space. It doesn't doesn't make a sound. Um, what would it look, what would it feel like if you put your hand in front of it? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of energy in these uh, very high velocity xenon ions. Kilowatts. I mean, this is a highly efficient system. So, of course, it's not perfectly efficient, so not all of the electrical energy goes into that beam, but it, it is very high energy. And so, 
if, if putting your hand in the vacuum of space was tolerable, you would not appreciate the effect of these high energy xenon ions uh, impinging on your skin. It would just, it would be, it'd be very damaging. It's, um, it's very energetic. Uh, and what was the third, oh, what if you stood 10 feet away from it? Standing 10 feet away from it is no problem because we have vacuum chambers and they operate in vacuum chambers. And as long as the vacuum chamber is less than uh, 20 feet across, it's easy to be within 10 feet of it. But we're in the safety of the laboratory outside. I don't know, does that, it maybe it didn't really get it. It starts your, to help, yeah. But, but the point is, it produces the, so the, the glow in that picture that I showed you is um, the benefit of effective photography. If you look with your eye, you can see it. But it's not exactly blinding. Mm. Um, but it just is this gentle glow as these ions exit with a velocity that's so high you can't detect their motion, both because of the velocity and their, their tiny size. I don't know, does that? Yeah, thank okay. thanks very much. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Oh. Um, so with the ion engine, uh, how long did it actually take you guys to make it? And I've got a second question. You mean well. how long did it take to fabricate it, or how long did it take to how long did it take to manufacture it, or how long did it take to make it from Earth to our destination? Uh, fabricate. Pardon me. Fabricate. Oh, um, like most of the components on the spacecraft, these things take. Um, I have to say, I don't know exactly how long, but you know, around a year or so. Most things take six months to a couple of years to make because. You have to produce these things to very high, um, very strict standards, right? Because you don't want them to, um, you want them to operate correctly in space. And they go through extensive testing. And so the total time to, um, from when you start with the raw materials until you have the ion engine on the spacecraft ready to go is years because you um, test the individual engine, then you put it on the spacecraft and test it on the spacecraft, and then you test the whole spacecraft with the engine on it. Um, does that? So we started building the spacecraft in um, in 2005, and didn't even launch it until 2007. I don't know. Does that? Address your question? Yeah. And then also, why did you use xenon as a, a propellant? OK, so there are a number of reasons for choosing xenon. And I should say that um, early tests of ion engines did use other propellants. Cesium and mercury were, were common ones. Um, but xenon has a number of advantages. One is I mentioned that it's one of the so-called noble gases or inert gases. So it's not chemically reactive. And so that means that. When uh, technicians are loading it onto the spacecraft, there is no uh, risk to their health. They don't have to wear um, special protective gear in case there's a leak. Um, another benefit of it is there's a mechanism that we, we understand well by which a little bit of the xenon actually leaks out of the engine at low velocity. And so the spacecraft ends up almost having this sort of cloud of xenon around it. And because xenon is inert, that doesn't present a risk to any of the other spacecraft systems from a chemically reactive um, compound that could degrade optical surfaces like damage the camera, say, or the solar rays, or interfere with the electronics, or even affect the temperature of surfaces, because everything on the spacecraft is, is designed with great care. And um, xenon won't interfere with any of that. And I can see you're eager to say something else, but I've already proven I'm wordy, so I need to tell you a couple more things. One is the xenon is very easy to store. We launched with 937 pounds contained in just 71 gallons. So a tank about this big, about a yard across, and about that tall. And so we need to be able to store this very effectively because space is at a premium in the spacecraft. OK, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was curious, as the end of the mission approached, were there any like particular like last things that you guys wanted to see there? And also about like the end of life uh, plan, like 
like, it will just float off into space. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure I heard you. Did you ask whether there were any particular things we wanted to see near the end of the mission? Yeah, like uh, as we were approaching that, the end of the mission. Did that evolve to? The okay, so that that's actually a, a kind of a fun question, um, but as it turns out, there weren't, and the reason is because we even before the end of the prime mission. So I should take you back. Dawn, like all NASA missions, has a well-defined set of objectives because you personally, you and I and all other taxpayers have made an investment in what NASA does. And so we have to make sure that investment is done responsibly. We don't just build a spacecraft and launch it and tell it to go do good things. We, we agree that it's worth this investment to accomplish a certain set of objectives. So we had a well-defined set of objectives that we wanted to accomplish on the mission. But we surpassed, not just met, but surpassed all of those objectives, I think by, it was either February or March, I think it was February of this year. But the end of the prime mission wasn't until June. So by the time the mission ended, we were already just ecstatic with this rich trove of data we were returning. And sure, there, I mean, the cosmos is endlessly fascinating, and there will always be interesting things to look at. But we were in the very fortunate position of not needing sort of urgently to just see one more thing. Certainly things we, we would like to see, and that's, that's how, why it's so wonderful that NASA has chosen to extend the mission to continue its operations. But there was nothing that, um, that by, the time of the, by the end of the prime mission, we felt we were sort of rushing to see. Does that answer that question? Yes. Okay, and I think the second question you asked is sort of what's the, and what's gonna happen to the spacecraft? It's going to stay in orbit around Ceres, just as surely as the moon stays in orbit around the Earth or the Earth stays in orbit around the sun, right? We, it, it's, it's a moon of Ceres. And so we will continue operating it as long as two important things, as long as two important criteria are met as long as the spacecraft remains healthy and productive, maybe that, that in itself is two uh, criteria, and the third, as long as NASA continues to choose to invest its precious and limited funding into Dawn. But in any case, um, when the spacecraft completes its operational lifetime, and I could explain, if people are interested, what, why that will occur, it will just become, the way I like to think of it is, it will become an inert celestial monument to human creativity and ingenuity in orbit around Ceres. That is, it's not gonna go anywhere else. It will remain in orbit. Thank you. Sure. Good evening. Hi. Thank you very much uh, that, uh, that you make dr our dreams about space true during most than 10 years. Well, and I should, if I can just interrupt you. It's not just your dreams, it's all our dreams, right? <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, and we're too. the same as you. It just, and this is so cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. And the question is, uh, what, uh, what's the biggest problem with the spacecraft uh, had happened um, during these 10 years of the mission, and how did you solve this problem? Okay, did somebody tell you to ask that question? <laughs> Nobody did, I know. Okay, no, so I'm, the biggest- I, I'm just a tester, so. <laughs> Okay, it's so my the, one. the question was, what's the biggest problem that happened to the spacecraft um, during the mission? And the nice thing is, if you asked anybody associated with the Dawn mission, you would get exactly the same answer, because we did have a big problem. I'll jump to the end and tell you the mission was successful, so it's okay, but the spacecraft has devices called reaction wheels. These are disks about this big that are electrically spun, and they're like gyroscopes, and there's a phenomenon that maybe you remember from high school physics, some of you, where you take a spinning bicycle wheel and hold it on a shaft like this, the wheel spins like this, and at least looks like maybe nobody went to the same high school I did. You sit on a, <laughs> sit on a bar stool, and as you rotate the wheel, the, you spin on the stool. This has to do with what experts call conservation of angular momentum. The point is, with these disks, as we change the speed at which they spin, we can turn, rotate the spacecraft. Because in the zero gravity, frictionless space, there's no other way to turn it. 
So if you have a wheel like this and you change its speed, the spacecraft will turn around it. So that's how we orient the spacecraft. And these other spacecraft as well around the room are not all of them, but many of them are oriented in the same way. So we need three of those because there are three dimensions, right? Up, down, left, right, front and back, or pitch, roll, and yaw. We need three. Along the lines of the earlier question, for redundancy, we have four because we couldn't, didn't want the mission to fail because of just some random failure. However, two have failed. And we didn't build the spacecraft to be able to tolerate two failures. And failures like that could be catastrophic for the mission. So one failed in June of 2010, one failed in August 2012, as we were actually um, in the process of breaking out of orbit from Vesta to begin the, the journey to Ceres. And there's really, I mean, there, there's no especially good reason that the mission should have been successful following that second failure. Um, but one of the things, again, that's so cool about these missions is that we found a way. And, and one of our mottos is, if it isn't impossible, it isn't worth doing. And so we found, I mean, that's, that's what makes NASA so neat, right? And so we found ways to control the spacecraft, to fly the spacecraft in ways we had truly never thought of, never even considered when the spacecraft was on Earth or even in its vicinity. And I'll just give you one aspect of that. It's, it's a much longer story, but I'll mention one of it because it comes back to one of the earlier questions. That is, we have a very small supply of a conventional rocket propellant called hydrazine. Um, we have uh, about 12 gallons of that on board. It was not meant for the purpose for which we're using it, but we have these thrusters on the spacecraft, a little thruster here and a little thruster here. If you squirt some out of this thruster, that makes the spacecraft turn like this. And if you squirt some out of this thruster, it makes the spacecraft turn like that. We hadn't intended to fly the spacecraft that way, but that's one of, the, um, one of the ways we're doing it. We didn't have enough of this so-called hydrazine, this chemical, to fly the mission this way. And so we undertook a very, very ambitious campaign. I mean, this was, this was a huge amount of work by a very dedicated and creative and capable team of men and women here at JPL and with our partners at Orbital ATK and, um, and came up with ways to use this hydrazine much, much more efficiently than we had ever anticipated. And so actually a year ago, it would not really have occurred to us that we would be in the position right now of being able to undertake an extended mission because the hydrazine was so tight that we didn't think it would last uh, until now, but it did. <laughs> so there's another wordy answer for you. Uh, it, look, it sounds like uh, this problem with gyroscopes, all right? This, these devices for orientation is, is very common for space, spacecrafts. It's uh, happened in the um, um, International Space uh, Station uh, a, a lot of times. By, uh, why, uh, what, what is the root cause for, for this problem? Uh, okay, so the question is, um, it sounds like these devices like gyroscopes that failures of them are common. Is that, Every is that time, a yeah. fair summary of your question? Pardon yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a very common problem and why it uh, happens every time with yeah. the spacecraft. Yeah, well, I, I, that's a good question, but I think it's, it's uh, somewhat of a misperception. Um, there are myriad <laughs> satellites and spacecraft with these devices that operate just flawlessly, essentially endlessly, for not just years, but decades. The ones you told you that was going to happen, so I'll, I'll invite um, the audiovisual people to go to something else or, thank you. Um, uh, uh, let's see, oh, they, they, they truly on most spacecraft, most satellites, they operate flawlessly for years and years and years and truly many, many billions of revolutions. Mm -hmm. The ones that don't operate are the ones that make the news that you've heard about. But really, they generally do work very, very well. Uh, there happens to be uh, a number of satellites that you, and spacecraft like Dawn that used one particular design, which we all found out too late, wasn't reliable for 
endless years of operation after the, the rigors of a launch, the temperature changes, the radiation, the, the forbidding environment of space. And so those have not worked successfully on a number of spacecraft. But on, on most satellites, they do. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it's just, it's just, just been sort of this batch of ones. But I should point out, I mean, here you've got a device that's spinning, right? It's not like an electrical circuit where nothing is, there's no mechanical uh, movement. But this, this constant motion for years and years and years without stopping, that's a pretty challenging problem for, uh, for people to solve to make them so they work reliably. So the truly overwhelming majority do work beautifully. Unfortunately, some, some don't. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to make a comment about his, uh, before I ask my question. Okay, Actually, although I will say on behalf of the yes, organizers here, we don't want to. Very quickly. Okay, okay. Uh, the Magellan spacecraft, uh, which mapped Venus, it did. used uh, uh, reaction wheels, and it, was, it worked for four years successfully. The space station used control moment gyros, it has been. Which are different from reaction very wheels. Very different, they are changing, the, but the same momentum kind of thing. And they worked successfully, no problem. Now, my question here is, is uh, about the electric propulsion and the ion propulsion. How much did JPL work on the development of the ion propulsion uh, being that important as, as we see here? And uh, how much industry? I mean, particularly use aircraft as, you know, develop the, the ion propulsion. I recall that in the mid-1970s, four young engineers came to JPL to work on electric propulsion. And after a short time, everyone went to do something else. Well, OK, so and I don't then, want to interrupt you, but is the question, what is the history of the development of right. ion propulsion? Uh, so the, and this term electric propulsion that he's using uh, is, is one of the other terms for it. And so um, it goes well back before that. The first, uh, first recorded um, thoughts about ion propulsion were by Robert Goddard in 1906, the father of American rocketry. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, known in the former Soviet Union and Russia as the father of cosmonautics, published a paper on it. Um, Ernst Stuhlinger, a colleague of Werner von Braun in the 1950s, did very important work on ion propulsion. You're making the entirely accurate point that engineers at Hughes Aircraft and elsewhere did. Uh, it was worked on by people in NASA and private industry um, from the 50s up to the present. So, I mean, there's a rich history here of many very creative and talented people contributing to the development of it. Uh, and I, if I suggested that JPL was the organization that developed it or was the, or thought of it or was the only one to work on. I didn't mean to suggest that. When I said that I raised the question of how could we travel around the solar system more easily and less expensively, it was that we could turn to the ion propulsion that, that people, brilliant people, had been working on for nearly a century. Now, was it, was it, it's very important for this travel. Why did JPL not follow it exactly? I mean, as with, the, with such importance. Well, that, so I'd be happy to talk with you about this more elsewhere. But you may have some um, perhaps incomplete perceptions of JPL's role in the development. JPL is not solely responsible for the development of ion propulsion. This was a joint NASA industry development. and. Um, and we've taken advantage of the brilliant work that was done by many people uh, to, to have this success. But I think rather than get into the details of the technical history, I think there are probably broader questions that would be of interest. But come up afterwards, yes. and we could talk about There's it. There's also so, thank the, you. Uh, ion propulsion is used for station keeping for Earth orbiting satellite. It Not is, but these are terms that most people here don't, they don't know about station keeping. But you're right. There are many spacecraft and satellites that use ion propulsion. That's true. I didn't say Dawn was the only one. No. In fact, 
Dawn is not the first interplanetary mission to use ion propulsion. JPL's Deep Space One was. That's where we learned to fly ion propulsion. But I'm glad you're so interested, and I'd be delighted to talk to you more about it afterwards. You obviously have some, some good knowledge of the history. How's it going? Um, Jupiter, going well. in one of the first photos you showed of the orbits of around the plan um, around Sun, Jupiter showed that it goes through these pockets of the asteroid belt, and I'm wondering why it didn't clear that material. Um, oh, does that make okay. sense? So, are you referring to the slide I had that showed all the asteroids and uh, sorry, the asteroid belt, and that both leading Jupiter and following it, or yeah, so there's like right. three that right. Okay, that, yeah. that's a, that's a good question. So it doesn't go through those because those are going around the sun just as Jupiter is going around the sun. Mm -hmm. But just so everybody else is following here, remember that picture of the asteroid belt. He uh, was observant enough to see that there are this, these two groups of asteroids uh, sort of ahead of and behind Jupiter. And uh, those are called Trojan asteroids. And um, they the bodies that, things that orbit the sun, or doesn't have to be orbiting the sun, but when one body is orbiting another, there turn out to be places in its orbit that are relatively stable for other bodies to orbit. And so both ahead of and behind Jupiter are two such places. So asteroids that happen to have sort of wandered through this place kind of get trapped there. For experts, there's a little bit of a simplification. But so it's not that Jupiter is plowing through them, but they're orbiting the sun with Jupiter, uh, and they're relatively stable. And there are places it, that um, are like that for Earth's orbit around the sun and even the moon's orbit around the Earth. And they're on the same ecliptical plane? Of they're close. Okay. They're close. Cool. Thank you. Sure. So there are people who are, oh, OK. So we were going to answer questions that came from the web, but there's another one first. Go ahead. Is there ever going to be a space tra that travels into space to refill the, um, to refill Dawn, a field? To refill Dawn? Oh, OK. So the question was, is there ever going to be another spacecraft to fly into space to re like to, to refuel it? That's actually a good question. And um, I guess I could answer that question by asking you a question. When you grow up, would you be willing to make a spacecraft that will travel into space <laughs> to refuel Dawn? And, and I hope the answer is yes. Uh, so NASA doesn't plan to do that, but we're waiting for smart, uh, creative, energetic, enthusiastic people like you to come up with great missions like that. But right now, Dawn, as I said, is well over a million times farther away than the space station. So uh, that's a pretty long way, even for a robotic that is um, spacecraft without astronauts on board to go to refuel another one. Rather, if we were going to send a satellite, a spacecraft out there, instead of carrying fuel, it could carry advanced new instruments and sensors, more sophisticated cameras and things like that that we haven't, haven't even thought of. Nevertheless, it's a great idea. And if you do it, and I'm old and retired, things send me a whatever the future communications method will be and <laughs> tell, me, tell me how Dawn was doing, OK? Does that answer your question? Good. Thank you. So, so we got a couple of questions from people who are watching right now in the live stream, and thank you for that. So uh, I'm not very good at pronouncing some of these things, so I will also spell it. But Kyanite, K-Y-A-N-I-T-E, asks, was there ever any plan for Dawn to visit a third body in the asteroid belt, such as Pallas? So uh, Pallas, P-A-L-L-A-S, is another very large body comparable in size to Vesta, although not quite as large. And the answer to that is no. There was never such a plan. But uh, I presume the background for the question is, for those 
space buffs here who read about these things on the internet. I've been reading for years. The Dawn has actually done, the Dawn team has done, has done studies of going to this other body palace. I, I genuinely don't know what the origin of that rumor is, but I can tell you, Kyanite and others, we've never, we never looked at it. I, I've read it many places. We never looked at it. Uh, we, um, our targets were Vesta and Ceres from the time we conceived them. We never had any intent to go anywhere else. However, as, um, as you may know from reading news recently, just in the last few months, we gave NASA the option of sending the spacecraft to another body for an extended mission possibility. So the, this extended mission, that is, after the completion of the primary mission. So we told NASA that if they would consider extending the mission, we could continue to stay in orbit around Ceres, or we could go to a different body. NASA considered the scientific merit of remaining in orbit, lingering, continuing to make the detailed observations at Ceres, or flying to a different body. They considered scientific merit and other considerations, and concluded that the best use of this precious resource that you and I as taxpayers have funded is to continue at Ceres to make more measurements of this you know, the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system. So I hope that answers your question. And the other question, I'll tell you this is going to be the last one, is from Arpotu, A-R-P-O-T-U, who asks, are we able to determine the mass of mass or other properties of the object, oh, of the object which collided with Vesta? I apologize for stumbling over that. So uh, th remember the big crater, this 300-mile diameter crater, uh, near the south pole of Vesta, which is the source of these meteorites, crashed into it around a billion years ago. And it's estimated that that body that crashed into it is around 30 or so miles in diameter. That's, that's pretty big. I mean, if you imagine that crashing into your backyard, you know, that, that probably wouldn't be appreciated by you or your neighbors. So that's, that's a big... <laughs> It's a big thing. It's, it's large compared to the object which crashed into Earth and is primarily responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs uh, and other species 66 million years ago. So that was, a, that was a big object, a big impact, and that's the estimated size of it. So once again, thank you very much for coming to JPL and hearing about the mission.